Hey there, my name is Alexis, and I'm going to show you how I made these picture frames with splines in them using just a circular saw and a router. Um, I decided to make this video because not only did I need some picture frames, but from what I've seen online, I've, I've only seen videos where you only need a table saw and a miter saw, as if those are the only tools you need to make a picture frame. And I thought, with the right jig, you can easily make a pretty good quality picture frame without having to invest a couple hundred dollars on some tools to make something as inexpensive as a picture frame. Right, I've made about eight or nine of these now and the quality keeps getting better and better. The miters are really clean and my splines look pretty good as well. And if you end up liking the video, consider like giving it a like, consider subscribing if you like my content. I try to upload at least once a month. Um, this is my first time speaking in front of the camera. I'm still kind of new to this, just trying new things out. If you like these types of intros, let me know. Also, I just want to say thank you to my subscribers. Uh, a few weeks ago, I hit 100 subs, and now um, one of my recent, my older videos just blew up out of nowhere, my pocket knife build video. Uh, I think it's at 50,000 views now, and now I'm at almost 250 subscribers. So thank you to all my subscribers. I hope you guys stick around. If not, no worries, but I appreciate the, the, the support. Um, anyone else that's not subscribed, consider subscribing. It helps the channel out, helps me out. Um, other than that, if you have Instagram, follow me at Builds by Alexis. I sometimes post behind the scenes types of photos for some of the builds that eventually come here. And I also put clips that sometimes don't make it into the final video because it just maybe is too long or it just doesn't fit right into the actual video itself. And also sometimes put um, update videos for when the next build video comes out. So consider following me there, subscribing here. Lastly, I do have an Etsy page. Um, thought I'd just mention it. Uh, I do have some build videos where I've actually put those items on the Etsy store. So check it out if you see, some, see something you might like. And I think that's about it. Uh, thanks for watching and let's get to the build video. Forgot one more thing to mention before I start. Uh, even though routers are smaller and cheaper, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not as dangerous as a table saw. Just want to mention it that always be cautious of the types of tools you're handling. Routers can be just as dangerous as a table saw. So if you were to do something like this, just definitely keep in mind that routers can be very dangerous if mishandled. So just want to <laughs> mention that before I continue with the video. Thank you. So the first trick I'm going to make is the one that makes the rabbits for the picture frames where the actual print or art piece that sits behind the actual frame. So I'm essentially replacing the plate that comes with the router and I'm going to replace it with a piece of half inch oak board. And the piece that I picked up was three and a half inches wide. Fortunately, it's the same width as the plate, although it technically it doesn't have to be the exact same width as long as it's wider. So I essentially mark out the holes using the plate that came with it to figure out where I should drill my holes. Then I drill holes that go th completely through the board and then I'm going to drill slightly bigger holes about halfway to maybe three quarters of the way in so that the heads of the screws can be countersunk as well as have the screws properly grab onto that metal head piece of the router. Once I install that oak board piece to the router, then I try to make a hole using a half inch straight router bit. I don't recommend this to anyone that's new to using routers, but how I did it is I held onto the router and then the metal base piece and then I carefully plunged the router little by little without putting much pressure onto it. If I were to do this again, I would have used a hole saw bit with my drill and used my tape measure to figure out the spacings that I want for the rabbits. Once I go through the oak board completely, I mark out the limits of where the router bit comes out. Then I figure out my spacings. On one side, I'm gonna have it spaced out about three quarters of an inch away. And then the other, I'm going to have about an inch away. But that's my preference, yours may be different. Once I mark out my spacings, I made the hole bigger, which is why I just recommend using a hole saw bit, especially since a hole saw will make your router jig look a lot cleaner than what I have here, which doesn't look very nice, but it's going to do the job. Next is to install the spacers, which is basically going to be the same height or thickness of the material you're going to be cutting the rabbits into. I'm going to be cutting into one by two oak board that's about three quarters of an inch thick, so I'm going to be installing quarter inch thick oak board pieces and I just attach it with wood glue make sure it's straight along the lines I marked out and then repeat it on the other side for the other spacing and I use clamps to hold it down temporarily and then after five to ten minutes I can install some screws 
And I always recommend pre-drilling your holes. Always, you never want to split your wood because then you got to start all over and then that's just extra work you need to do. And pre-drilling holes takes almost no time and effort. And afterwards, I countersink the screws just in case the screws get in the way of the router when I install it. Then I just cut off the excess oak board that I don't need. I wanted to leave maybe an inch or so sticking out on both sides just so you have better grip of everything. Then afterwards, I realized one of the spacer block pieces is actually covering some of the screw holes. So I just used a larger drill bit to just take some material off. Then I was able to reinstall the jig. Just be careful with the screws. You don't want to strip them. And now it's time to put the jig to the test. I put on my three quarter inch straight router bit. And at first I tried to just take all the material off that I needed at once. And I think I went maybe an eighth of an inch, give or take. And the router got a little too aggressive sometimes. And there are some locations along the oak board where I ended up veering away from the path a couple times. So you'll see later where I took off too much material. So on the second round of taking material off, I flipped it to the smaller setting or the larger spacing. So now on this pass, I'm taking off a half inch material first. I flip the router jig, and then I take off the remaining quarter inch of material. And it definitely was a lot easier. Yeah, you spend a tiny bit more time, I guess, going two passes every time, but the, the results look a lot nicer. But here is where you're gonna see where I veered off the path a couple times when I just try to take a lot of material off at once and the router couldn't handle that. So I definitely recommend taking off about two thirds of the material and then from taking the remaining third so that you have a much cleaner cut. So I went about a quarter inch deep total into the oak board because my particular art piece has a quarter inch border around it, but that might not apply to you. So the depth you go into is gonna vary depending on what you're gonna put there. So the next jig I'm going to make is a miter saw jig which is going to allow me to use a circular saw to make perfect miter cuts or close to perfect mitered cuts. I use melamine, but you can use plywood or whatever you want. What's important is that both pieces should have two sides that make a perfect 90 degree angle. Once you have those two pieces, I clamp them together and I use the circular saw to make a 45 degree cut. Before I made the cut, I used a carpenter square to make a line on both pieces on the right side of the board so that I can use that for reference later, as well as mark out a line for where I'm going to put the pieces of melamine board that's going to act as the fence for the miter saw jig. And to attach it temporarily, I used the painter's tape and super glue trick and made sure the piece was perfectly square to the right side of the board. Then I just screwed it in from the bottom. And that back piece doesn't have to be 90 degrees. That's just there for stability purposes. So before I installed the top plate, I made sure those lines that I marked out line up before I put in the final screws. And you might be wondering why there is melamine missing on the top of the plate. And that's just because the previous night I, I attempted to do this and I forgot that the fence pieces need to stick out because when I cut the oak board, you need to clamp them down or secure them somehow before you make a cut. So I made sure they stuck out at least three inches from both sides. After that, I installed these shims that I made out of oak board, but you can buy pre-cut oak board that already comes a quarter inch thick or a half inch thick. I just had these lying around, so I used those. And to figure out where the shims go, I just put the circular saw into the actual jig, and then I just put the shims on both sides to make sure the circular saw doesn't jiggle or move side to side as you're cutting into it so that it keeps it moving in one straight direction. And if you do everything right, using the carpenter square to check everything's 45 degrees, you should have a pretty close to 45 degree cut, which is what I got here. Uh, hopefully, if you were to do this, you get this right on the first try as well, but um, I think as long as you're within 44 to 45 degrees, you should be good. Just make sure it's not going 46 degrees. Just make sure you have it oriented right. If your pieces aren't perfectly 45 degrees, and if you want to check to see how straight your cuts are, you can mark out the 45 degree angle on the side and then a straight 90 degree angle on the back side of the oak board that you're cutting so that you can see how accurate your cuts are. And as you can see here, my cuts are pretty close to perfect, if not perfect. And a technique I've seen to help you keep your pieces equal length is to cut two of them at the same time. As long as you have them marked out correctly, you should be able to achieve equal lengths on both sides or all four sides, depending on what your dimensions are for your picture frame. And you could cut them to rough length and then you know cut little by little, but whatever works for you, just try your best to make sure these pieces are equal length. If they're off by maybe a 16th of an inch, you're probably okay. I just wouldn't go more than a 16th of an inch in terms of deviation. 
Once I cut the pieces to final length, I check to see how square they are by measuring their diagonal distances. Um, the distance from one corner directly opposite of them and if they're equal or close to equal they should be pretty square. After that I mark out lines on all four corners of the frame so that once I apply the glue and put it back together I could use those lines as a reference so that I know for certain that the frame is still square after I apply the glue. So before the actual glue up, I put a thin coat of wood glue on all sides of the frames where there's gonna be contact. Because you're working with end grain to end grain, the wood is gonna suck up a lot of the glue in the beginning. So by putting a primary thin coat, the wood glue is gonna suck that up. And then once you put a second coat, the wood glue should be better in terms of keeping the two wood pieces together. Once I've applied glue on all the contact surfaces, I reapply the painter's tape that held it on initially. And then I use the lines I marked out earlier to make sure I'm keeping them still square. Then I use this strap clamp by Bessie to hold everything together and then put a lot of pressure on all four corners. And to make sure my frame is perfectly 90 degrees, um, I think two out of the four corners were perfectly 90 and then there were, the other two were slightly off. I just use these 90 degree clamps to just keep them in place. Though I don't think you need it unless your frames are very out of square then you may need them, but mine were like slightly off, but I already had them in hand, so it didn't hurt me to use them. Once everything has been clamped up, you could put it to the side and wait for the glue to dry. In the meantime, you could be working on the last jig, which is to make the splines for the picture frames. So I picked up some oak board that's five and a half inches wide, and then I cut one inch strips until I had four of them. And that's gonna basically be my border around the router. And in terms of dimensions, this is based off my router, which has a plate that is three and a half inch by three and a half inch. So the inside dimensions I want here is gonna be three and a half inches by five and a half inches. Though I think I would have gone maybe six inches at a minimum, but five and a half is good enough for me. And what's important here is to make sure the shorter inside dimension, that three and a half inch dimension is as tight as possible with the router. You don't want that router shifting left and right as you're going along the length of the jig. And since you're using this router jig to make splines, you don't want to have that spline be wider than it should be and not have a proper bond between the spline and the frame. And you want to achieve a snug fit. You don't want it to be too tight, but you don't want it to be too loose. So you gotta just find a happy medium. And worst case scenario, you could use paste wax to lubricate the sides of the jig to help it move better, but uh, you should be fine. It shouldn't be too hard to get it to fit right. So once you have that set, then you can install the remaining borders. And I just use wood glue to have it set first. And then I pre-drill my holes and install the screws. And yes, I did forget to install one screw, but I do eventually put that one in. If I don't know how I missed that the first time. Next, I'm gonna cut these four triangular pieces from some scrap oak board that I had lying around. You could use plywood, but I think hardwood is better for this type of application. And in terms of dimensions, I cut them to about three and a half inches wide and three and a half inches tall. Um, and the exact size probably doesn't matter. I think it should be at least three inches so that you can screw into the sides of those pieces. But then again, this is catering to my specific router. It may have to be bigger or it could be smaller depending on your router. But once you see how it's actually put together, you'll have a general idea of how big it should or shouldn't be if you were to make this jig. While it doesn't hurt for the angles to be 45 degrees, it doesn't have to be perfectly 45. It worked for me fine when I used the miter box. If you want to use a circular saw and make perfect 45 degrees, you're welcome to do that. Next is to glue and screw these triangular pieces to the underside of the top plate piece of the jig that you made in the beginning. Before I glue them in, I first made a line down the middle across the short dimension of the underside of the top plate, if that makes sense. <laughs> And then I just put a bit of pressure for a few seconds just to make sure they're properly bonded to the top plate. And then I just wait like five minutes before I decide to screw into them just to make sure there's a somewhat proper bond so that these don't slide off on me when I screw into those triangular pieces. So I removed the screws I initially put in the beginning for the top plate and then I drill deeper holes and then I install longer screws so that the screws are holding the top plate and that triangular piece. I'm gonna start calling it a bracket from now on because I, I, it's such a long word to keep saying triangular piece, triangular piece. So once those first screws are in, I add one more screw to hold the brackets at each end. And then that part of that build should be almost done. Next is to make an opening. There are many ways to do this. I used a hole saw and I just made three holes along the length. 
at the center of the jig and I think the total length of the opening I made is about three inches long. I could probably make it smaller but this was good enough for me. It, it enables me to see the actual miter when I cut the splines for them eventually. The last part of this build is to make the legs, I guess if I want to call it that. Um, I just use some plywood and then the length of the plywood is about 12 inches long and then the width is just the inside dimension between the two bracket pieces. Um, you could get away with cutting them shorter. You could probably have them six or seven inches long and still have it work. I just just was lazy and didn't want to do two more cuts to shorten it down. Once you have your two leg pieces, you screw them into the brackets. Um, just make sure you pre-drill each hole since you're cutting into the edge grain of the plywood and you'll very you'll most likely split the plywood if you don't pre-drill. And in the beginning, I didn't have the plywood legs touch the bottom of the base. Initially, I left a gap there, but I do end up relocating them so that the legs touch the bottom of the base because I'm able to cut into the plywood and then it actually shows me the limits or the path, I should say, of the router bit when it's going into the mitered frame and help me align the jig so that I put the splines where I actually want them relative to the frame. So here's how the picture frame looks with the splines marked out. Well, the spline locations marked out. And I use this piece of wood to keep it flat because there's a groove here, so it's not going to be flat unless I have a spacer here. So now I just got to lay this down just to line it up. And it shouldn't take long. Maybe I should make the lines a little bit wider, but once I have it accurately lined up, which looks pretty close. I clamp it down on this side. I clamp it on this side and this side, just to keep it from moving. And I should be able to make the grooves pretty easily. So once the jig is lined up with the lines that I made on the actual frame, I'll clamp the jig to the frame on both the top and bottom legs. And then I can start working on my passes. In terms of how many passes and how deep I went, it kind of ranged between a sixteenth of an inch and three thirty seconds of an inch deep every pass. Uh, whenever I went about an eighth of an inch, it kind of felt a little too aggressive. And the total depth, I went about ten sixteenths of an inch into the frame. It was like just before it reached the other side of the actual frame. I don't know if there's a set rule on how deep your spline should be. I guess it depends on how thick your frame is and... A uh, half inch is probably good enough if you're using three quarter inch material. Um, I just felt like going a little bit deeper. I guess it also depends how deep your rabbits are. If you plan on putting your splines where the rabbits are on the other side, then you would have to go shallower. So if you want to be safe, you could put the splines on the thicker side of the frame. And since I used a quarter inch straight router bit, I'm using quarter inch thick oak board to fill in those splines. And I guess a way for me to efficiently use my oak board, I just cut the splines almost all the way through and then I could just finish it up with the handsaw and then I could just get all four pieces out of a two inch long strip without having to lose material. I forgot to film myself installing the splines but it's pretty self-explanatory. You just apply glue to the spline, let it sit in there for you know an hour and then you should be able to remove the excess. I use a flush trim saw to remove the excess. It's really quick and simple to handle and it's not super sharp that you're at risk of cutting yourself. So I definitely recommend this tool. It's good for cutting splines, cutting dowels. I've used this for a ton of projects now. And if there's still a bit of excess material that the handsaw couldn't get, you could always use some sandpaper and remove it manually. Or if you have a finished sander, you can also do that. I normally use 150 grit sandpaper to remove excess material as well as clean up any glue stains that may have resulted from the glue up, but you can also just use much larger splines so that there's more material sticking out so that you could use the flush trim handsaw for all of them. I even decided to tie myself here and I ended up taking off one frame's worth of splines in the span of two and a half minutes. So th th this type of tool is super handy for these types of applications as well as other applications. Lastly, all that's left is to finish sanding them before you apply your stain and your poly. Um, for glue squeeze out and I guess rough surfaces, I would recommend using 150 grit sandpaper. And then once you do with all the rough surfaces, you finish sanding it with 220 grit sandpaper. 
And for edges and corners, I would always hand sand them. I would never use a orbital sander or a finish sander because you don't know how aggressive they can be and take off too much material. Once you've sanded your frame smooth and applied your stain and poly, next is to cut your glass or your acrylic in this case. If you see my past videos, I've used acrylic a lot, so I'm more comfortable using this versus glass. I tried using glass and it didn't work, so I picked up a new sheet of acrylic and I used an acrylic cutter and a straight edge and it cut pretty well, like cut on both sides so that it has a much cleaner cut. If you're cutting only a small piece off the larger sheet, I drilled a hole at the corner point so that I could just use that as a reference and not have to cut a whole portion and then cut that portion off and then end up with waste because acrylic can be expensive. And glass in general is cheaper than acrylic, but it can also depend on how many pieces you actually need. For example, I needed to get multiple pieces. I think I needed six or seven pieces of acrylic or glass, and it just made more sense for me to use acrylic versus glass. Since it was only a couple dollars more expensive, but I was more comfortable using acrylic than using glass. Once I fit the acrylic in, I made sure the, the print itself fit first before I continue with the hardware. And to, I guess, protect the back, I just used whatever came in the packaging. It was this like styrofoam cardboard like material. And I just cut it to size because it was a little bit bigger than the print it came in. And for some of the other prints that I didn't have backing for, I just recycled some cardboard that I had lying around and that worked perfectly fine. And to hold everything down, I picked up these picture frame turn buttons that didn't really work for my particular frame because they're a little bit thicker. So I just use these pliers and I bend them at the head so that they can be resting inside of the frame and then just be screwed on the, I guess, inside where the rabbits are versus on the outside back where it normally is installed. And this works really well. I'm not concerned of it breaking because I bent it. It's still pretty sturdy even after bending it so uh, i definitely recommend this and versus picking up an alternative tool to make it work for this type of frame especially since it's not going to be holding a lot of weight to begin with next is to install the wire hardware that's gonna allow it to hang and i didn't want any hardware showing from the back so i decided to modify the screws by cutting them a little bit shorter because the ones that came with this hardware is longer than the thickness of the frame you could just ignore this step and just and screw it directly behind the frame versus on the inside but i just didn't feel like having it stick out even though it probably won't be noticeable anyway i'm actually not sure what that tool is called it was just something my parents always had um, if i find out the name i'll put it in the description but uh, everything that i use here or that's available online i'll put it in the description if you happen to be interested and the only tool i needed to purchase was this crimping tool that's meant to secure the wires when you install the picture hanging hardware and it's just meant to secure the collars that hold the wires together. It just squeezes around the wires to keep it from sliding out. And it worked really well. This tool in particular has different settings for different size collars, for different size wires. And it also has a, I guess, a, a cutting feature that allows you to cut the wire to length if you need to. Um, this is probably overkill, but I decided to double up on the wire length and then use a third collar to hold the extra wire together just to make this a little bit more secure, even though it was most likely not needed. But since this was my first time messing with picture frames and hanging hardware, I just wanted to be extra safe. In the end, I had to redo this or had to shorten it because the wire was too loose and it wasn't hanging well. Fortunately, I was still able to reuse that same wire since it was long enough and I just had to use one extra collar. So in terms of the tension, I just made it just slightly loose. Um, it definitely hangs better, though I think I have it a little too close to the midpoint of the frame. It should be raised a lot higher, but I'm going to leave it as is for now. And if I don't like it, I could always just move it. It's not going to cost me anything. I could just have to make some new holes. And I think it's been a long time since I last hung a picture frame. So I used painter's tape to help me out where I should hang it. And I just used the painter's tape to mark out where the midpoint of the frame is and where on the wall I wanted to hang. And then I just needed to figure out where is the hook going to be relative to the top of that picture frame. And for me, it was about three inches to from the top of the hook to the top of the picture frame. And then I just marked out that location on the wall. If for whatever reason, you're not allowed to put holes in a wall to hang pictures, uh, there are alternatives. I've used these adhesive Velcro strips to hold some of my paintings in the past. And they've worked really well and apparently you can just easily remove it and they don't leave any marks on the walls i haven't removed them yet but they in terms of holding the pictures they definitely work and i'll put some in the description if you think those might be something you might want just make sure if you were to get it just make sure it's rated for the right weight 
And also make sure the picture frame is level before you attach it to the wall because then you have to adjust it and it might not look as good. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you're still watching, definitely appreciate it. This is my first time making picture frames and I learned a lot of things and those jigs that I've made are really handy. I might use them for other projects like that spline jig. I could probably use that to reinforce some mitered boxes that I might make in the future for a coffee table that I have. And that rabbiting jig could also be useful. I actually used that to mill down some uneven strips of oak board that I had lying around and I made a mini picture frame, which I also used the spline jig to add splines to and it still worked. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time in this video to include it. I do have some footage of it, so I may put it on here or if not my Instagram, so be sure to follow there. I also made a floating picture frame. I think that's what it's called. I'm not entirely sure, but I didn't have enough time in this video. It would have ended up being 30 plus minutes if I did. I might put it on my Instagram or if it's long enough, I could put it here on this channel in a, maybe a couple weeks if you're interested. If you do like this video and want to see that other build, uh, like this video, also subscribe. So thanks again for watching and take care.